Well, we're always happy to have three ABN camp meeting, whether it's summer, whether it's fall or whenever, because we love interacting with you. And uh, it's such a joy. We've been doing camp meeting for well over 30 years, and it's been such a blessing. Sometimes when we do, we'll call it the digital camp meetings. Uh, we like it better when we have all the audience here, but you know what? We're gonna go with whatever is best, the best way to get it out. But, and no matter what, the gospel has to continue to go to all the world. Jesus says when this gospel of the kingdom goes into all the world, then the end, or should we say the start of eternity will happen. And that's what we're all looking for. So thank you all for joining us. We're so uh, happy to have you today. And uh, today we've named, I've actually entitled this message, Just in the Nick of Time. Now for some of the younger folk, you say, what's that? I've never heard of that. I just kind of grew up with it. So I'm taking it for granted that many of you understand the term, but just in case you're not familiar, I'm gonna see how what Webster says about it, okay? Webster says this, just before the last moment when something can be changed or something bad will happen. For instance, he decided just in the nick of time, the ambulance arrived when just in the nick of time. Well, I have a friend whose daughter was working in the Twin Towers on 9-11. She was on the 66th floor and when American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower, instead of staying in place, as so many did, she immediately ran down the stairs, made it safely all the way down and out of the building, just in the nick of time. The building shortly thereafter fell, collapsing, killing nearly 3,000 people and injuring almost 6,000 people a horrific day never to be forgotten. The Bible tells us in the last days that bad things will be happening with more frequency than ever before. It mentions famines and earthquakes and pestilences. And of course, don't forget the last plagues. Whether you're reading Matthew 24 or the prophecies of Daniel Revelation, they all are pointing to the end times. I think we can add COVID-19 into this equation also, don't you? But from Genesis to Revelation, the good news is that while we live in a sinful world, it's only temporary for the Christian. Why? Because according to the Bible, Jesus Christ will come back to this earth, guess when? Just in the nick of time to save those who choose to follow him by accepting his free gift of salvation. Isn't that amazing? Thank you, Jesus. I have no doubt that we're living in the end times. This world would self-implode without God's presence. In fact, Matthew 24th chapter, verses 21 and 22 says this, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Verse 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, that's all of us, right, that are Christians, the days shall be shortened. Thank you, Jesus, for that. I'm sure you realize that we're living in a really uncertain, crazy, and mixed up world. Now, I'm going to hang with me here, all right? I want you to hang with me. Listen to this question. Let me ask some of you older folk. Did you ever think you would live to see a time when our public schools and Walt Disney World would openly admit their satanic-inspired agenda is to teach our young children about gender identity? In other words, teaching our kids that LGBTQ and transgender issues are acceptable behavior for young children. In public schools, videos about hormone blockers are being shown to young children as early as the fifth grade. Now, a horm hormone blocker is a substance that inhibits the production of the natural sex hormones in a biological male or female. In other words, testosterone would be administered to a female to inhibit estrogen production. And did you ever think you would live in a time when because a biological man thinks he's a woman, that the government passes laws to try to make the rest of us play along with his mental illness? But it does get more absurd. Get this, a number of medical schools are now denying biological sex. What's that mean? Professors are apologizing for saying male and female. Students are policing the teachers. One Harvard professor made this statement that we can't really know a child's gender at birth. What, let me say that again. Did I say that right? 
Yes, the professor said, a Harvard professor, made the statement, we can't really know a child's gender at birth. Really? Since when? A five-year-old child knows the difference between a girl or boy at birth, right? But university professors don't. Isn't it amazing? You can have a doctor's degree, get this, and don't know there are only two genders of, the male, of human beings, male and female, just as God created us. That's it. There's nothing else. Anything else is a lie. This is absolutely absurd and demonic. Our educators who go along with these kinds of political correctness lies not only deny science, but the Bible as well and are leading our young people down the road of spiritual darkness. Brothers and sisters, this is not a time for the church to be silent. This is a time for the church to stand up and be counted. We're doing that here at 3ABN. We should be giving the loud cry. That's our commission. Remember Isaiah 58, 1? The cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. I'm convinced that most people are looking for meaning and purpose to their life, aren't you? And are probably asking a lot of the same questions that you and I have asked at some point in our lives. Why am I here? How long will I be here? What's my purpose for being here on planet Earth? And where am I going when this life is over? I recently heard the world's richest man and apparently one of the smartest men say, at least by man's standards, he's the smartest, he wonders about the meaning of life in the universe. He's asking the same question and the same questions that everyone else at one time or another is asking. It's kind of summed up like this. We're all in the same boat. Humans everywhere around the world, we're all in the same boat. One of the old songs my dad used to sing uh, says, no matter how high in society they go or how much money they save, when they close their eyes in death, they'll only feel one grave. There are billions of people in this mixed up and crazy planet who have questions about life and the hereafter. And the good news is we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians have the answers for this world's problems. Isn't that good news? You see, we understand how the worlds were formed and that God created us in his image to live with him forever. And we understand that because of sin, we are now born in a sinful world with a terminal illness called death. There's only one way of escape, and that is through the love and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Now, you want the bad news? Let me just be honest. We'll put out the bad news, too, okay? Now, the bad news is this. Most of us so-called Christians are so caught up in our own personal problems that we aren't living a happy, victorious life. It is impossible to be continually unhappy and be living for Jesus. Or maybe, let me say it like this. If Jesus is living in us, it is impossible to be constantly unhappy or living in fear. When we are in love with Jesus, he will be the center of our joy. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect what peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And of course, Psalms 119, 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. I love it. We cannot allow the enemy of God to rob us of our salvation and our joy. Now, we've read the back of the book, and it says that we Christians win. We should be excited, right? You remember where it says it? Revelation 12, 11. I hope you got your Bibles with me today. Please get your Bibles out. At least make notes. What's it say? And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto what? Unto death. Yes, we can live happy, victorious lives right now. God's promises are there for everyone. Read Isaiah 54, 17. Tell me this doesn't excite you. No weapon, Isaiah 54, look, look at it with me. 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. <laughs> okay. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I mean, what great promises these are. And Revelation sums it up like this in the last chapter of the Bible. It's beautiful. Revelation chapter 22, 12 to 14. And it says this, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man 
according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Listen to this, how beautiful. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. Wow. The Bible is full of promises. Every Christian should be looking forward to the second coming of Christ, right? We should be the happiest, most excited people on planet Earth. Let me ask you, are you living your life in such a way that people want peace and joy that you have? If not, we're failing our mission that God has called us to do. And that is to reflect his character of love to the whole world. See, Jesus says in John 12, 32, you've heard me repeat this many times. I, if I be lifted up from this earth, will do what? Will draw some men to me. Oh, is that what it says? No, let me do it again. I, if I be lifted up from this earth, will draw all men unto me. You see, people are looking for answers in those of us who carry the name of Christian. What kind of an example are you setting? We cannot carry out the great gospel commission of Matthew 28 when we ourselves look and act like much of the rest of the world. In fact, I'm going to be really bold again and say here that I believe a great percentage of Christians today are depressed and discouraged. I'm not talking about doubting the fact that there is a God. I'm talking about not being close enough to God to sense and feel his presence in the good times and the bad. I'm always amazed when I hear Christians complaining and saying things like, where was God when I lost my husband or wife? Where was God when I was going through my divorce? Where was God when I lost my job? And on and on and on. If you became a Christian because you believed that you'd be exempt from being attacked by the devil, I would advise you to think again. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, and this is very important, Ephesians 6, 11 to 12, put on the whole armor of God. We're talking about a spiritual armor. Let's say it again. Once we submit and commit our lives to Jesus, the devil hates us even more. So he's going to be constantly attacking us. So this scriptures tells us, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wow. There is a great spiritual battle going on between good and evil in each of our lives. And yes, we all are part of the great controversy going on between God and Satan for the soul of every man and woman that has ever been born into this world of sin. As soon as we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, we must put on, if we want to survive, the armor of God. In other words, we put on our spiritual shield. This shield protects us from the deadly spiritual attacks of Satan the enemy, whose mission is, again, to destroy. When we put on the spiritual armor of God, Satan has no control over our life. Isn't that great news? You ought to be really, somebody should be saying praise the Lord. Somebody should be lifting your hands. Somebody should be shouting out there. Satan has no control over our lives. He's a defeated foe. The Lord is our shield and he's our protector. When we put on the armor of Christ, Satan cannot rob us of eternity with Jesus Christ. Did you get that? When we put on the armor of Christ, Satan has no control of us. He cannot rob us. He may rob us of our health. He can rob us. He's a prince of this earth. He can rob us of our finances. He can rob us of relationships, but he cannot rob us of our soul because our soul does not belong to Satan. It belongs to who? It belongs to God. So as Christians, we can find great comfort in knowing that while we're born in this world, we are not of this world. Jesus said it to Pilate. Remember, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So listen to these beautiful words by Jesus in John 14, 1 to 3. I love these. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. There it is, brothers and sisters, the choice is ours. Praise be to God that we can choose between eternal life or eternal death. There's no other choice 
we can make. It's one or the other for all eternity. Okay, so now let's talk about something really important because people say, well, you Christians talk about all of this and that and yet you're getting sick and you're dying and how do you say God is there in the nick of time when I lost someone or I've got cancer? Well, let me talk about this for a minute. We're going to talk about the difference in this physical realm, I'm going to call it, or the spiritual realm. In the physical realm of life, we die. In the spiritual realm of life, we live for eternity. Get the difference? Because we were born in a world of sin. But in the spiritual realm, when we take on the, and submit and commit our lives to Jesus Christ, right, and put on that armor of God, now Jesus is working in our behalf. No, we don't deserve it, but he's doing it. It's that free gift of salvation. But we have to know and believe and trust in him every day and forget our feelings. Our feelings are too much in the physical. I call this living in the spiritual realm when we're able to, to literally trust God. Here's where you find the victory through Jesus Christ. But now if I listen to Satan's lies and choose to live in the physical realm without God's protection over my life, I will ultimately die and lose out on eternal life. Why? Because the Bible says, and you know this, the wages of sin is death, okay? Sin, of course, is the transgression or the breaking of God's Ten Commandment law. Help me out. That's 1 John 3, 4. In other words, rebellion against God's law is living in the physical world. You cannot and will not win the battle as death will come way too quickly. When we live in the spiritual realm, we live by spiritual principles that are given to us in the Bible. So simply put, no matter what happens to us physically in this world, as long as we live for Jesus, we submit and commit our life to him, we win the battle over death, hell, and the grave for all eternity because Jesus won it for us. Now he's offering us that free gift because of his literally giving his life on, no one took his life. They talk about they took his life. No, no, Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary as an atonement for our sins. Praise the Lord for that. Because of the lack of time in this sermon, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures on how to be saved today. But we do have a little book, however, that I'm happy to send you for free. It's entitled The Truth About Salvation. So if you're not a Christian or one who's maybe really struggling Please contact us here at 3ABN for your free copy. Now I want to get to the meat of the sermon, if I can use that term without some saint getting offended. The meat of the sermon, you get it. Some of, you, some of you got it. Some of it went over your head. As Christians, we should have peace in the midst of the storm and should never be discouraged by what is going on around us. Right? Why? The fact is, God is always there for us and he's always on time when we need him. Now I'm going to say that one more time. Listen to this. Just a little slower, I'll say it, okay? God is always there for us and is always and is always and is always on time when we need him. All right, isn't that great news? <laughs> He's there for us and is always on time. You've heard that saying, God is good all the time. That's absolutely true. And yes, guess what? He shows up just when we need him just in the nick of time. It's a reminder that God is our ever-present help in time of need. Let me read it to you. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. That's Isaiah 65, 24. Don't you love scripture? Don't you love to get in and divide the word of God? I mean, how can we be discouraged when we've read the back of the book. This is amazing. Your life has been on God's mind since long before conception. If you're like, well, where's God when I need him? Boy, I'll tell you what, I'm having this tough time and nobody cares about me. I don't think God loves me anymore. I don't even know that he knows. I've heard, pe heard people, and probably you have too, I don't, even, I don't even know if God knows I exist anymore. Well, let me, let me answer that from the Bible. He says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. That's Jeremiah 1, 5. Read it for yourself. For the modern-day Christian that claims a woman has a right to choose to abort a baby that God placed in her womb, please read that scripture again. Now, that's another sermon for another time. We'll, do, we'll talk about that later. But today, 
I want to encourage you to look back over your life and think of the times that the Lord showed up just in the nick of time for you. I'm going to share a few uh, of these just in the nick of time stories myself. Why? I found that recounting God's hand in our lives only strengthens our faith and trust in him today and in the future. It's all about deciding for oneself to believe in coincidence or divine providence. For me, that's an easy decision, and I hope it is for you too. Well, let's see what that means. According to Webster, the word coincidence means the occurrence of events that happen at the same time by accident, but seem to have some connection. I'm not into that. What about you? <laughs> Um, I can't imagine living my life trusting in coincidence to get me through. Can you? Well, according to the dictionary, divine providence means this, a manifestation of divine care or direction. But I'm more interested in what the Bible say, says. What does the Bible say about divine providence? I'll give you just a few quick scriptures. Again, please have your Bible with me. How, you, how would you like to trust in this? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, once again, that little word, isn't that amazing? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to what? To his purpose. Then Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all of your need. How much? That little word again, all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Or 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way, listen to this, will also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So there's nothing more that you can't take. You will be able to take whatever the devil throws at you, and we should be able to do it and in, 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 in say, Lord, I'm going to do it in a cheery way. Why? Because I'm not looking at the now. I'm looking at the future, and I understand that you have given me the opportunity for life eternal. So Matthew 6, 26, I love this scripture. I mean, all of these scriptures are so dear to me, and, and I hope, hope they are to you too. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not bet much better than they? Wow. And there are more scriptures confirming that God knew us before we were born and that he has a plan to help us get through this world of sin. Many, many more. We could go on and on and on. So why is it that so many Christians get depressed and despondent when things don't go the way they planned? Well, right there is probably it, the way they planned. We need to remember Jeremiah. We could live on the scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11. If you don't know it, you should memorize it. What does it say? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That future is eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain. Can you imagine that? I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And we'll find out in those who keep his commandments. What more can we ask for? Just because you don't see him does not mean Jesus is not there when you need him or that he showed up late or forgot about you. That's what the enemy, the devil, would try to make you think, right? But he's a liar, remember, and the truth's not in him. Do you remember when Jesus got word that Lazarus had died? He didn't go straight to Mary and Martha. He waited a couple days. Finally, when Jesus got to them, what did Mary say to Jesus? You remember, she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would have not died. What Mary and Martha didn't know was that when it seemed Jesus was four days late, guess what? He was, I'm going to lift my hand on this. He was still on time. I'm going to say it again. When Jesus was four days late, you say it with me. He was what? He was still on time. Isn't that amazing? See, we think we know God's timing. We don't know but he does for sure. So one more time, when he was how many days late? He was still on time. So Jesus went to the tomb, you know the story, and he called Lazarus' name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth bound in his grave clothes. So when it appeared to the human eye that Jesus was too late, he was still on time. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. You know why? And, and of course, Lazarus did come forth 
from being dead and smelling bad to coming back to life again. But just think, do you know why he said, Lazarus, come forth? Because had he just said, come forth, every person in the world that had died would come forth because Jesus has victory over death, hell, and the grave. Somebody say amen, because I'm getting excited myself when I think about it, and the, the, the power that God has and the love that God has for fallen man and the opportunity that he's giving each and every one of us to be living in the closing moments of earth's history. Again, I'm gonna repeat this again. We ought to be the happiest, most excited people in all the world. We don't have any worry to, to, to fret, we, we, any reason to worry or fret. Why? Because Jesus loves us and has a plan for us to get us through this world of sin. There's an old song by Irving Berlin that says, when you're worried and cannot sleep, just count your blessings instead of sheep and you'll fall asleep counting your blessings. Well, I have to tell you today, I get to tell you today that God's blessings in my life and in the ministry of 3ABN are too numerous to count. How about you? So if you're worried and cannot sleep, I suggest you count God's blessings instead of sheep. Remember, God is in the business of saving souls, and guess what? He uses people just like you and me to carry the gospel into all the world. I've learned a lot in the last 38 years of ministry, but one of the most important things I've ever learned is this. The blessing of God is on the go. I have to repeat that. The blessing of God is on the go. When he said Matthew 28, 18 to 20, go ye into all the world, and we step out in faith, God honors that. So we don't have to have gone to the seminary. Sometimes they say cemetery for four years. We don't have to go to this school. We don't have to go to that school. Ellen White makes a st statement, five seconds under the unction of the Holy Spirit is worth more than years in literary institutions. We're living in the closing moments of verse history. So if you can do that, that's great. But for those of you who have the call of God on your life, the only certification you need to be an evangelist for Jesus is the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the willingness to go, to step out in faith by sharing your own personal testimony of what God has done for you. God doesn't call us because we're perfect or qualified. He calls us because we're willing to be used as vessels of honor on his behalf. He has to use people in spite of us. Now that may be a scary thought for many of you who have never stepped out in faith to witness to others, Maybe why? Because you're shy. I started to joke and say like myself, but I, it's something I've not really been since I was a kid, I guess I could say is too shy. Or maybe you like self-confidence. All of us do that at times or for whatever. But I'm here today to tell you that I can promise you that when you share your testimony with the lost, that God will bless your efforts and souls will be one to the kingdom of God. Just when you begin to think that you've made a mess of things or offended someone, the Lord will show up when? Just in the nick of time. I hope you're starting to say that with me. The Lord will show up. That's the way he does in all of us. We mess up every day. But when we need him, he's always there. When? Just he'll be there just in the nick of time. He's already there. But for us in our frailness and humanness, we don't always see him. But he's there. So here, he'll show up just in the nick of time. And how does he do it? Through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So you can have that on you. You just have to pray and ask God, Lord, what would you have me to do? Where do you want me to go? And I promise you, as you accept Jesus Christ and you ask for anointing of the Holy Spirit, it will be there. When you begin to doubt your ability to be a witness for Jesus, focus on this scripture. I love this one. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, what? Void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So this is saying, no matter who we are, no matter, it's not about our delivery, how great a delivery. Some preachers are known to have this great delivery. Delivery is not important. What comes out of their mouth is important, whether they're preaching truth. And when you preach the truth, and I've, I've said this for years, I believe that we could have hired an atheist actor to just get on the set and just read the Bible. Nothing else, not say one word of his own. Read the Bible and people would be drawn 
to Jesus. You know why? It's not about the actor. It's not about the, re- the preacher. It's not about the reader. It's about the Lord has promised if you give his truth out to a lost and dying world that it will not return void. So therefore, we can have all the confidence in Jesus that we need that he's going to bless us so that no matter we may say it in a timid way, we may not be all excited, but if it gets out there and you share, and here's what, what is it that you want to do? If you haven't gone to school, as we talked about early, just the blessings of sharing the gospel are so incredible. There's no feeling on earth that can compare with it. I know that because I've experienced it myself. And I, I, it, just knowing that God, think about this for a minute, knowing that you can partner with God. How does that make you feel? The Lord says, yeah, I'll work in you and through you. You submit and commit your life to me, go and tell. So it's the Holy Spirit that's working in us and through us in spite of us for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. So it's really pretty simple, folks, as we start to wind down this part. We do our best and God does the rest. Now I want to share with you a few stories where God showed up, at least from the human perspective, just in the nick of time. I'm going to take you back to when Mark Finley and I were doing a Thursday Night Live. And I'll never forget because people would call in questions. And about the second hour, for some reason, I looked at Mark and I said, Mark, there may be somebody tonight. There may be somebody tonight who's thinking about committing suicide. Could you speak to that person? And Mark immediately, I remember he leaned into the camera and he said, friend, if you're contemplating suicide, don't. And I remember right as he said that, we have these big lights at the time, they're glass lights and they literally, one of them exploded and hot glass that would, could burn you flew in several feet around the studio. Fortunately, never hit any of our, any, any of our workers there. But, I knew the devil was angry. So the program was over. Eight months later, nine months later, I go to the Caribbean. And I'm preaching there. There's a lot of people, a crowd of several thousand people. And because everyone, so many people there watch 3ABN, they kind of had guys walking with you so you could get from one place to the other. And I remember we were just getting ready to go up on the, 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 the platform to speak when this young man kind of leaned over uh, some, a couple guys there by me, and he said, Mr. Shelton, I just want you to know that 3ABN saved my life. And I looked at him, and I said, what? He said, yes. And I said, come on up with me. I said, let him come with me up on the stage. And I didn't know him, never met him before, so we got up on the stage, and I said, I said uh, uh, sir, tell us, tell us, now this is a young man, probably 19, 20 years old. I said, tell us your story. You just told me that 3ABN had played a part in your, your salvation. And he said, well, I want to tell you, about eight or nine months ago, I had come to the end of my ropes. I had come to the point in my life that I felt like that I didn't want to live anymore. So I decided to kill myself. I felt like that's the easiest and best way out. So he said, I sat down in a, in a chair, and I just had my hands on the arms, and I was building up enough nerve to do it. And it was later in the afternoon or early evening, and as it began to get dark, suddenly I said, okay, I'm I'm ready. I can do it. So he says, as I get up to go into the bathroom, now I don't know if he was going to OD, what he was going to do, but he said, as I got up to head to the bathroom, my arm hit something on on the arm of the, the chair. And it turned out to be what? A television remote. He said, it turned the television on automatically and it came on to 3ABN. And when it did, immediately I had stood up, already was standing up, immediately Mark Finley looked into the camera and said, friend, if you're contemplating suicide, don't. Jesus loves you. And then he went on to do as only Mark Finley can do, show the love of God and talk about the love and how much he was loved. This young man stopped in his tracks. He said, there has to be a God And God had to have impressed that because he was looking directly at me. I mean, that's an amazing story. Now, go up four or five years, six years, whatever later, I'm talking to Pastor Mark, and he said, hey, I was in the Caribbean, and I was at this big church, and he said this young man came up, and uh, the, I think, associate pastor of the church came up and talked to him, and he said, hey, I'm the guy 
that several years ago when you and Danny Shelton were on a 3A being live, I'm the guy that you pointed your finger to. I was the one sitting in the chair getting ready to get up and knock the TV re remote in the floor when 3ABN came on. And Mark, you, sp you spoke directly to me. He said, I've since been to the seminary and now I'm the associate pastor of this church. Now, come on, somebody, you ought to be getting excited. Somebody, I should be hearing some praise the Lord's all the way through the television screen. I mean, is that an amazing thing or what? I'm absolutely love those kind of stories. Now, what I did, I'm going to tell you a couple more of those. I got a little time left. And I'm going to tell you, I made a couple notes on these because I want to make sure I get them right. Now, this one's a Johnny Denzi story. I got this one from him. We're going to talk about a woman named Lulu. So I'm going to look at my notes here. And uh, Lulu uh, from um, Puerto Rico, I think, she was a nightclub singer. Her son ended up in jail and Lulu got really depressed and she had a lot of problems, and so she decided to take sleeping pills because she said she didn't want to wake up anymore. Literally wanted to get out of this, this world. So she's in the evening. For whatever reason, she turns on the TV and found 3ABN, and I wrote down what he gave me. During the program, a voice spoke to Lulu and said, Why are you carrying that heavy load? Give them to me. I will take those burdens and I will give you peace. Now, you think that was of the Lord or that is the devil? I'm going to tell you that was the Lord. The next day, she was driving to work. She looked to the side of the road at a stoplight and saw Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, here's the thing. Lulu had driven that road to work every day. She had never seen a Seventh-day Adventist Church. So she sees the church. So she decides, you know what? I need to start attending so Sabbath, I'm going to go to church. So Sabbath, she so shows up at church, and guess what? They just happen to be having an evangelistic series going on. And, of course, she stays for the series, gives her heart to Jesus, and gets baptized. Now, come on. Somebody else, you're going to be happy. As, as my wife Yvonne says, sometimes there's going to be a little shouting going on here. We're getting all excited. Okay, here's another. You think God doesn't show up in the nick of time? Look at this. I love this story. This one, we're going to use the name Carlos. He's from Colombia, had a different name, but an amazing story that also came from Latino. So Carlos, um, he had a, he had a, a, a disease. He had a, a sickness. And for whatever reason, I don't know the details, but for whatever reason, he had to have a leg amputated. So, of course, he was very discouraged and he was very depressed. But then after a period of time, his health got worse. So the doctor told him, you know, Carlos, I'm afraid we're going to have to amputate the other leg. Well, Carlos didn't want that. Who would? No one would. So again, he slid farther into depression. Man, what am I going to do? Things can't get any worse, Carlos said. Just how are they going to get any worse? And then his wife broke him the news. Carlos, I'm sorry, I can't take this anymore. It's too much pressure. I'm leaving you. I want a divorce. So here's Carlos. He's already had an amputation. The doctor says he's going to have to have another one. And now he finds out that his wife wants a divorce. She's leaving him. So he says, you know what? I just want to end my life. I'm going to end my life. So he was talking to a friend and they got on the subject of guns. And Carlos said, I wonder where a guy could rent a gun if he wanted one. And the guy said, the friend said, oh, there's a guy down the road that he has several. He's private and not a dealer, I guess. And he has some guns so you could rent one from him. So Carlos said, well, I want to go see this guy and I want to rent a gun. What was he going to rent the gun for? He was going to kill himself. So Carlos goes to the place. Now, this part of the story, I, I love when, it, when, I, when I read this. I loved it. This part of the story, you got to love. So Carlos goes to, knocks on the door. The guy opens the door and he says, I understand you have guns for rent. And the guy said, well, I have several. And uh, he said, I want one. I want to rent one. Now get this one. I'm going to have to hold myself up so I don't fall down. The guy says <laughs> to him, well, you know what? I'm sorry. All of my guns are rented out. I don't have any guns for you. 
course, he didn't know what Carlos was going to do with it. I don't have any guns. Carlos was so depressed, he left, and as he was walking away, <laughs> as he was walking away, he said, I have the most terrible luck in the entire world. My luck is so bad, I can't even rent a gun to kill myself. <laughs> now, you think God hadn't already showed up and been there just in the nick of time? Those guns were gone. So he goes home, has nothing else to do, but he turns on three AB, turns on the television and finds three ABN Latino. Carlos is so excited that he watches all night long. I'm talking about all night long. By the morning, he gave his heart to Jesus and said, I'm going to look up a Seventh-day Adventist church. So he showed up at a Seventh-day Adventist church. They were so thrilled to have him. He told him the story that they, of course, he was taking Bible studies and whatever, but ended up getting baptized. Now, because of the health message, he's changed his whole diet. His, his health started getting better. Think about that. And the doctor said to him, now, you know what, Carlos? We're not going to have to amputate that other leg. We're not going to have to amputate it. Praise the Lord. I get to keep it. So a friend from church said, I've, I, I've got a job for you. I, I, I can help you get a job. So now he's able to keep his leg. He's happy. He's found that peace we were talking about all uh, this, this whole time. And so he's now excited. He's going to get a job. And so he gets the job. And then guess what else happens? Of course, the doctor already says we're not going to have to amputate. But then through a series of events, his wife comes back to him and they reunite their marriage. I mean, how beautiful is that? You see what the devil tries to steal from us, the Lord, the Lord will give it back. And it's not always when we want it and how we want it, but it will come back. In this case, God honored that. The Lord was there just in the nick of time. Otherwise, Carlos would have been dead. My next story is, is a man in condominium. This man, and I don't know the background. I know the prayer. Uh, I got it from the, uh, some of our prayer partners that had called in. And so he was late at night and he was at the end of his ropes. And he said, I'm going to kill myself. Now, the difference between him and Carlo or Carlos, the difference between him, he had a gun and he had bullets in the gun. It was late at night when he made the decision somewhere around midnight. So he said, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kill myself. But he lived in a condominium and there was uh, some other folk around him. So he said, well, I, I'm going to do it tonight, but I don't want to disturb everybody at night. So, and I can't wait till tomorrow. I've got to end it now. So I'm going to turn on the television. Now get this, this is with my hand up. I'm going to turn on the television and I'm going to turn the volume up so loud. I want to turn the volume up so loud that my neighbors won't hear. Okay. Are you, you following this? Some of you are already guessing where this is going, right? I want to turn the volume up so loud when I pull the trigger, it won't disturb all the neighbors. Well, when he turned it on, I believe they said it was Elder John Carter. Now, didn't purposely turn on 3ABM, but he turned on the TV and Elder Carter was there and said, Jesus loves you. And he started talking about the plan of salvation. And again, the man listened and he listened and he listened. And by next morning, he called our pastoral department and said, pray with me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I mean, those are the stories. Honestly, folks, we could go on and on and on. When you think about your money that you're giving to 3ABN, is it doing any good? Uh, it, it, when I, the investments I give to 3ABN, I'm a donor too, because I believe in it. And I believe in the technology that God has given us literally to reach out to a lost and dying world. Isn't it amazing how God's willing to use any of us? Who would have thought when, when Mark Finley leaned into that we said if somebody was maybe contemplating suicide, who could have thought the young man was getting up to go do it and a remote would fall in the floor? Now, is that coincidence or divine providence? Somebody, somebody answered that for me. I can hear you from there. That's divine providence. That's baloney with that, that coincidence, right? Are you with me on that? So I'm amazed at God. And I thank you for being a, a supporter and a partner with 3ABN as we take this everlasting gospel, the undiluted three angels messages, one that would counteract the counterfeit into all the world. Thank you for your love and your prayers and the partnership and being able to work together 
to take the gospel to the world. Now, everything doesn't have to, when the Lord shows up in the nick of time, it doesn't have to be life or death. It doesn't have to be anything that maybe the world would look at and say, oh, wow, this is amazing. But I'm going to run over just to have a few minutes left, and I'm going to go over just a, a few little quick stories. I remember back in the early 80s, before 3ABN, God was preparing me. God was preparing me for 3ABN. I was playing basketball. I broke my wrist, and I broke the navicular bone, so the doctor said, this is going to be two or three casts. You may be out four to six months' work. Well, I was in my probably late 20s. I didn't have any money. I didn't have insurance. Couldn't work for a while. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I was just, just praying about it. And so I went to church on Sabbath, took my little family. We went to West Frankfurt Church. And I remember when they took up the offering that I reached in my pocket and I pulled out $2. I promise you, that's all I had to my name. I didn't want to ask family or friends or anybody. I was just hoping and praying the Lord would somehow bless. Had $2 to my name. And my, it was, my cast was coming off that week, so I was going to be able to start work again, doing some more carpentry work. So the offering plate came by, and I didn't put the $2 in. You know why? I said to myself, what am I going to do? If I give that $2, I don't have anything. And then as the deacons went up and they prayed over it, and they were leaving, going out with, with the plates, I motioned to one of them, and I put in the $2. You know why? I heard this impression. Do you trust me or you trust that $2? Oh, <laughs> that wasn't much, of, that was not much of a, uh, a choice, right? You trust me or do you trust that $2? I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I put in the $2. So I'm going home from church broke. We stay after church, we visit a while, which we, a lot of you do too. So I live on this, church is on the east side of West Frankfurt. I lived at the time on the west side. So we got along Main Street. So we're driving home, penniless. And I come to a stoplight right past the post office. There's a stoplight. And when it stops, it's not a long. It's less than a minute at most. But I pull a stop. And just as I do, I see a woman walking across in front of the van. She looks up and waves at me. Hey, Danny, how are you doing? Now, I have to tell you, this lady, I, I remember several years before that if she needed something, and, and you could say a friend of the family, an older lady, but if she needed something, she didn't mind asking people to help her out. So she said, hey, Danny, pull over, pull over. I got to talk to you. So I said, well, that's all right, because I don't have anything to give her, but I'll pull over and talk to her. So I pulled over on the curb and she came over and she said, I wonder, am I so glad I saw you? I've been wanting to call you. She said, you remember about four or five years ago when they were going to turn my electricity off and, and that I was out of money and I came to your house and you loaned me $109? I said, no, I, I don't remember that. Well, well, you did. You loaned me $109. And I said, no. And then I thought about it. I said, oh, yeah. I said, you know what? I gave you $109. I didn't loan it to you. I had totally forgot about it. You know what she said to me? Well, the Lord has blessed me. I have a house now where I keep older people, and I'm getting money in from that. And the Lord has blessed me, and I've been wanting to look you up and pay you back that $109. She opens her purse, pulls out $109 cash in her purse. I mean, I don't know, maybe y'all carry a lot. I was it, Definitely in those days, I didn't carry that kind of money. She pulled out $109 and said, here, thank you so much. Now, again, is that coincidence or divine providence? What's the chances of me just driving home from church at that exact time when that stoplight was there as she was walking across the street, but God showed up? just in the nick of time. That got me through. I can tell you over and over, Hal Steenson went to his church, and you, some of you have heard it. It was when they first came to Southern Illinois in early 80s, and just came there. And my electric, that's when I had to cast again, and in my arm, and it hadn't been working. Electric bill came, and this time a red note on it, the big red one, you don't want to get that one, $164, going to be cut off Friday. Hal had about 10, 12 people that would start at his little church in West Frankfurt, he and Molly. And so he had asked me to come and my family to come up and sing to them. So we did. At the end of the, in the middle of the service, he said, hey, uh, we're going to take up an offering for you. There literally was maybe, I'm going to say a dozen at most. So I've heard myself say, no, Brother Hal, don't, don't worry about it. We don't, 
well, no, we want to take you an offering. I said, no, that's okay. Now, this was Thursday night. He had his prayer meetings on Thursday night, not Wednesday, so it wouldn't conflict with other churches because he was trying to new in the area and getting more people to visit. So I said, no, please don't. Well, after the service, I was packing up the, the, the van, putting the equipment in it that we had and was packing up. And, but as I left, there were three men there. And I remember those three men. I just talked to one of them the other day. His name is Steve Adkins. Grew up in West Frankfurt here with us. And so as I went out, I shook hands with, with Brother Steve, and I felt something in my hand. So I put it in my pocket. The next one was Wayne Griffiths, a piano player, musician from this area. It was one, I think there were only three males there other than Hal that night. And so he handed me a $20 bill. I put that one in my pocket. So uh, the other male, and I don't remember who this one was, the other man came up. And as we shook hands, he said, thank you for being here. Each one of them, and I've never had that happen before or since. Once in a while, somebody hands you, but not everybody or nobody. So I had three people handed me bills. I go outside. We start to drive off. Brother Hal comes out and says, oh, oh, Brother Danny, stop. The Lord's impressed me to write you a check for a weird amount. And I said, a weird amount? He said, I don't know why, but you apparently have a need. I hadn't told anyone. You apparently have a need. And so the Lord told me to write it so you'll know what it is. So we drove away. I thanked him. We drove away. I, I reached in my pocket, pulled out the money, handed it to my wife. She counted it. She said, these are three twenties, sixty dollars. House check was one hundred and four. Now, how much did I say I need? I needed one hundred and sixty four dollars. One hundred and sixty four dollars was my electric bill that next day had to be paid. Now, I could go on and on and on and tell you these kind of stories, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up just a little bit because here's one I really love, and we're about lack of time. I'm going to talk to you about a young man you might know by the name of Greg Morricone. And Greg sent this. I asked him for a nick of time, nick of, uh, just in the nick of time story, and here's what he wrote. In 1999, I was looking for a media college internship site. I sent an email to 3ABN inquiring about the possibility. 3ABN was my first choice for many reasons. One being my family had followed and supported 3ABN from early on and believed what God was doing through the ministry. I waited a while but did not receive a response back either way. My college advisor was very supportive of 3ABN being an internship site for me. As the days went by and no reply from 3ABN, shame on me, my advisor, I said that, not Greg, my, my advisor told me, this is Greg speaking, I had to make a decision to go elsewhere because time was running out. I waited until the last possible moment to write the, the alternate internship site. I remember the day well as I went to the school computer and opened up my Yahoo email account on that old computer. I remember being sad that I was going to type an email that would send me someplace else other than 3ABN. Before I wrote the email, I checked my inbox and for one last time for anything new. Right toward the top was an email reply from 3ABN saying they were willing to bring me on as a college intern. What an absolutely exciting moment for me. It was a matter of five or ten minutes that I would have gone in a different direction other than 3ABN. This is not, was not happenstance but divine providence. On Monday, September 27, 1999, I stepped foot into the main building of 3ABN as a nervous intern. What an incredible journey it has been through the years to serve the Lord here. That's from Greg Marconi. Think what would have happened had Greg made that decision. The Lord showed up just in the nick of time. He and Jill has changed my life and our folks' lives around here and literally potentially millions of people's lives around the world because of they, the, the way they listen to the Holy Spirit. So I'm so thankful for both of them. And thank you, Lord, for being there uh, just in the nick of time. I just got maybe time for one more quick one. I just had a, a Adventist friend of mine uh, uh, call me. We were talking and he said, my granddaughter uh, has cancer. And so she's been taking treatments and it's been very expensive. And so my daughter didn't have the money. So I put up all the money to get all of the treatment for this cancer. But he said, I, I, of course, I was going to do it. But 
I knew that I was going to owe a lot of money in taxes. He said about $200,000 of taxes. So I was scrambling around trying to see how I was going to get the money now to pay my taxes. I had spent so much on the, the, the treatments at, at the hospital for the hospital bills. So he said, I received a card from my daughter and my granddaughter thanking me for the help and for the generous donations and how to, that they paid, you know, that uh, their bill was paid. So it was the thank you card. So of course that's gotta make him feel good and he knew that he'd been a part of it and been blessed to be a part of it. But he said, I laid the card down. Just as I laid the card down, my phone rang. I picked up my phone. Now this was just a few weeks ago, he told me this. I picked up the phone and it was my accountant. And she said, guess what? She said, I have been looking over all of your finances. She said, and, and because of everything I've gone through and so many uh, charitable donations you've given through the year, you will owe the government this year zero. <laughs> Not one penny. See how God blessed, showed up just in the nick of time. I was scrambling around seeing where I could get the money. Well, guess what? You don't need the money. I'm going to ask my wife, Yvonne, to come out right now. And um, Yvonne, I'm, I'm so blessed when I can share stories of other people's and you hear these testimonies. Yes. What's that do for you? Uh, it's so inspiring. It's, come on up here. It is so inspiring and encouraging because we know that the Lord steps in just in the nick of time. Mm -hmm. Just in the nick of time. Now, I want to ask here, I'm going to put you on the spot, but do you have a just in the nick of time story you would be willing to share? I have a couple, but I'll, right. I'll just share okay. one. All right, let's do So 2009 was really like the, the bottom dropped out for me in 2009. The first thing that really happened was in May, I lost my sister. Mm. And she had been very ill, and so... I lost her, and then in September, the Lord called me out from the profession that I had. I was practicing traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, mm -hmm. and, um, and the Lord told me to come out of that, and it was 95% of my income. Wow. So I knew, though. But the blessing was on the go, so you decided I'm going to, even though it's going to cost me, I'm, I'm going to step away from it. Yeah, I knew that the Lord would take care of me. Okay. I knew I wasn't worried about what I was going to do, even though I knew I had lost a lot of my income. Mm -hmm. But I knew that the Lord would take care of me because all my life he's taken care of me. So long story short, I, um, I had started writing a book. And that book, um, I didn't know how I was going to print it. I didn't know where the money was going to come from to print the book. But I knew that my job was just to write it. And I felt I like impressed that. Okay. that my job was to write it and, and the Lord was impressing me that he would take care of the rest. Okay. So I finished the book. A friend of mine won a legal case and gave me the money to print the book. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> and then I, had, I was re-signing my lease in this apartment and as a bonus for re-signing the lease, I got a month free, which then allowed me time to set up this lifestyle course that I was giving. Mm -hmm. And then that same book got me an interview here through C.A. Murray. Okay. And who is my interviewer? <laughs> me? <laughs> Absolutely. So what a blessing. I mean, the Lord... The Lord came, stepped in just in the nick of time. Just when you needed it. Just right? when I needed it. Well, here's the great thing. We were telling these stories and we're talking about living in the physical and living in the spiritual. Mm -hmm. But what we have so to look forward to, and I look forward to it, and I know you do too, is the second coming, coming of Jesus Christ. Yes. The scriptures we read earlier, this world would self-destruct, except the Lord says because of the elect, he's going to cut it short. Amen. So... Just a few years ago, the Lord gave me a song. It was just setting home, and, and it's a song that I really had to think about and pray about and to finish it. And uh, so we had the privilege of uh, working together with Larry Goss and some of the uh, other folk here and some great musicians, Tim and others. But uh, this song I entitled, uh, Just In Time. Just In Time. Mm. 
There were famines and earthquakes With trouble all around The heavens did shake No peace could be found There were wars and strife on air It seemed God had lost with no hope for man. Where is your God? The demons cried. He's left you here to die. Your truth has failed. It's all been a lie But a shout all from heaven Can now be heard It came from God The living word The joy in time, a Savior came, just in time, He called my name, salvation's plan for fallen man, redemption by the great I am. There appears in the east a small black cloud, half the size of a man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. In solemn silence, they gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth becoming lighter and more glorious until it is a great white cloud, its base a glory like consuming fire, and above it the rainbow of the covenant. Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror, not now a man of sorrows to drink the bitter cup of shame and woe. He comes victor in heaven and earth to judge the living and the dead. With anthems of celestial melody, the holy angels of vast unnumbered throng attend him on his way. The firmament seems filled with radiant forms, ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. No human pen can portray the scene. No mortal mind is adequate to conceive its splendor. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise and his brightness was like the light. As the living cloud comes still nearer, every eye beholds the Prince of Life. No crown of thorns now mars that sacred head, but a diadem of glory rests on his holy brow. His countenance outshines the dazzling brightness of the noonday sun, and on his robe and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, then just in time, my Savior came, just in time, He called my name, salvation's plan for
Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Thank Lord. Thank you. Wow. Praise the Lord. Wow. Amen. What an amazing scene. You know, when you start thinking about the second coming and, mm -hmm. and the Lord returning and you see 10,000 times, 10,000 <laughs> and thousands of thousands filling up mm -hmm. the sky to take us home. Some of that talking part actually came from a great controversy on Ellen White. Yes. And uh, so the Lord just put that together. I'm blessed. And, and how you can do it in such perfect timing and right do all the talking and oh, come right, <laughs> right out. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at that, and I'm so thankful. We only have about uh, two and a half minutes here, and maybe why don't you look into the camera? And someone just said to me uh, back here, Greg said, maybe there's somebody that's watching today that's thinking about taking their life. Oh. What would you say? Jesus loves you so much. He would not want you to lose out on the plan that he has for your life. Don't despair. Life doesn't always stay the same. God's got something special for you to do for him, and your life will be so changed if you just give your heart to him. Praise the Lord. And you always call our number on the screen, 1-800-752-3226 or 618-627-4651. Could you also give us a closing prayer? We may, if we need to, just go out. And praying today. All right. Dear Lord, we just praise you so much. Thank you so much for the words that you gave Danny today, the words of encouragement and inspiration, Lord. So many times we need to hear just how you step in in the nick of time. So we thank you so much for doing that in all of our lives. Please be with us, guide us, direct us, and help us all to be ready so that when you come, just in time, Lord, we will be ready to go with you and live forever in your presence. Thank you so much for this prayer and for your goodness and mercy toward us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.